Right, so uh, caves and hills, you might tend to think, well, what does it matter how old the hills are? Well, they can actually tell us quite a lot about cave development. And if you're a cave digger, which I have been in the past, they can actually help you to sort of figure out, well, where's the best place to look either on the surface or, or, or underground? Now, an awful lot of the Earth is unfortunately made of rock that is not limestone. These are the silicate rocks, mostly. Um, and they're dissected by surface drainage. So you've got the Zambezi Gorge here with these amazing sort of zigzag gorge. These are the Mourne Mountains, where I live these days. Uh, granite's 56 million years old, so we know the landscape, the hills, must have been exposed since then. So the landscape is less than 56 million years old. But the problem is that, of course, you're removing stuff. How do you actually get a date, work out how old something is if it's been taken away? Well, in fact, the process of erosion also creates stuff. It creates sediment. And so the sediment deposits are actually a record of... Uh, the erosion. And so, for instance, we've got here, this is a great load of sediment. This comes from erosion up here, you see. And the first stuff to be eroded is going to be at the bottom of this heap. And the most recent stuff is going to be at the top. So that gives you a sort of proxy sort of record, a chronological record of what's been going on in terms of that landscape development. And the ideal sort of situation is you get in some place where you get these river terraces, where rivers, as they have incised down, they've cut down, and they leave abandoned little patches of gravel here and there. And this is uh, the seven terraces. And you can work out a relative chronology here. And that's the chronology where you can say, well, that's older than this, and this is younger than that. So the oldest sort of patches are going to be up here. And as the river cuts down, it leaves successively kind of younger patches. You never see a perfect sort of spread like this at one place. It's all along the course of the river. So you've got a relative chronology of younger and younger sort of terraces. And within those terraces, which that's a relative record, we can't say how old they are. But you might get these sort of sediments here. And you've got some stuff here which might contain bits of hippos or rhinos or mammoths or, or pollen grains, stuff like that. And the older stuff is there, and then it's got younger stuff sort of buried on top. Those can give us what I broadly group together as absolute chronologies. Now, none of these chronologies are absolute. They're not like, you know, 19th July, Ice Age ends. It's more sort of, it gives us an idea, a number in which to sort of hang uh, a date on. So sometimes the dates might be fairly precise, as in radiometric dating with styles and things like that. Sometimes it's much broader. But it, it gives us numbers, and if you like to know, well, how old is that? You know, cave is, oh, my cave is older than yours, you know. Anyway, so that's great. We've got relative chronologies, and we've also got absolute chronologies, and you can perhaps do it with these kind of uh, river terrace systems. But you have a problem in that a big chunk of, uh, of uh, Britain and the whole of Ireland has been repeatedly glaciated. And the effect of that is it just wipes clean all those beautiful river terraces and it modifies the channels. So almost what you get is a landscape that you can say, well, that's kind of late glacial, something like that. So it, it can be a real, real problem to actually work out, well, what about the longer term development and evolution of the landscape? Well, limestone landscapes, you see, are much superior, as we all know, um, because they, rather than have surface drainage, which they tend not to have a great deal of, they are dissected by underground drainage. And the fact is that that's putting all those channels underground where they're going to be protected from those ghastly glaciers and such like. Uh, I was going to say, they, they put them into a strong and stable environment. <laughs> anyway, so... And the important thing is, what I'm really talking about here is these kind of stream caves, swallowed to resurgence caves, not the kind of hypergene caves and things like that. And there you've got the underground drainage is going to be intimately linked to what's actually going on on the surface. So as the surface changes, it is going to have an influence on those underground drainage channels. And because caves, they're, they're bedrock channels, they're in, they're in rock, you see, so they tend to be quite resistant to, to channel rerouting, whereas... Uh, river channels, quite often, it's also sand and gravel and stuff like that. So as the river comes along, it easily erodes that away. So they're, they're pretty tough. So that means that earlier routes, which are these, the kind of relic cave passages, they're often preserved intact for us to explore. And the great thing about them is that because they've got a roof on, these are these roof con conduits, unless they're very old and the surface has come down to intercept them, they actually preserve a history from the earlier stages of inception right through to abandonment. So they can tell us a great deal about the evolution of that particular drainage route. They also form an effective trap for sediment and animals. And caves and their contents are protected from surface weathering and erosion. Strong, stable environment again. 
And so in summary, what you get, caves preserve, they preserve evidence of changing drainage patterns through time. And they also preserve stuff that's within the passage. It's either been generated in situ, which is, uh, you know, stales, spilithems, and various other things, and also stuff from, introduced from outside, which could be sediments, or it could be mammoths and hippos and things like that. So in a way, if we look at it in the broader sense, caves combine aspects a bit like a leaky bucket, in that as the surface landscape changes and perhaps the, the valley is inside, you get a lower outlet, the water starts leaking out of the limestone via a different route. And over time, all of those routes will be preserved, so all of these individual holes in the bucket will actually be there. And then it's just a case of working out which hole came first and then trying to relate that to how the land surface landscape has changed. And of course, because these passages are, can be quite deep underground, it's a bit like the back of the sofa. You can preserve stuff there which you thought had gone long ago because glasses have removed everything on the surface, and then there, lo and behold, there it is, underground. So, but if you're trying to work out how the landscape has changed, choose your passage carefully. Horizontal passages are best because a slight change in, in base level, or the, the level at which the water is actually ultimately emerging from the limestone, can have a very considerable effect on passages like this. It will mean that the water is going to kind of either cut down to the floor or it's going to find another low, low road. So you can get the whole succession of sort of lower passages. Whereas this sort of thing, it's great, you know, deep, spectacular, scares me shitless, but um, if you drop base level by 50 or 100 meters, all it does is the shaft gets deeper. If you take 100, 200 meters off the top of this, well, it's not as deep as it was, but it doesn't tell you so much about the landscape. So horizontal caves, like Ogof Drynan, are fantastic. Okay, so here's a very, very simple cave. There's no cave in reality is this simple. And so you've got Here's the sort of impermeable catchment area. That's what silicate rocks are for. Um, and the, the water sort of sinks down there, and you've got sort of Vado's passages, uh, and then it goes down here, and it enters the phreatic zone, and it comes out at a, at a rising. These are these parogenetic passages. Anyway. Um, but over time, of course, the landscape does change, and this is uh, an old sink, which clearly was, water was feeding into this when the shale margin was somewhere out here. So that's told you the shale margin has moved back. Over some, so that's part of an older landscape, relatively older sort of section of passage. And then you've got an older passage here where it went to a rising that was a, a level when the, the valley floor was higher. And so you've got those preserves. So that's telling you that this is an earlier cave. So it's a relative chronology. And then within the cave, oh, there we go. Within the cave, we've got things like this. You've got the classic sort of phreatic to Vedos transition, these keyhole passages. So those are telling you a little bit about um, how the cave is actually uh, well, we'll go to something a little bit more complicated. Uh, I was going to do Mooley, but I thought, no, it's much too complicated. Anyway, so this is Cheddar. Cheddar is actually a relatively simple system. It's got a whole load of Swalik caves way, way over here, and they converge on a single streamway coming down here. And then when you get down to the actual show cave area, this is the current active uh, streamway, you get a whole series of uh, passages. And you can build up a relative chronology here in that clearly this is the current course of the water, the river passage, and then these are abandoned passages, and the higher up you go, those are progressively older um, passages. And these are linked, you can link these quite clearly to the, uh, and Andy Found has done a lot of work on this, and you can link these to the down cutting of the Cheddar Gorge, which kind of meanders around down there, as the floor of the gorge has been lowered, so that has caused the water to be rerouted to lower roots and down to its present uh, level. And then, of course, there's stalls which, as Andy said, they clutter up a passage, you see. They obscure the, the beauty of the scallops and things. And we can get uranium series dates, perhaps going back half a million years, or uranium lead dates even further. Uh, and you get these dates here, 120, 230, 380. Those dates actually more or less correspond to warm periods during the last sort of two million years. And so we can start to link the chronology of these caves to actually what's going on in the bigger sort of climate. So you've got Stale deposition when it's relatively warm, down cutting of the gorge when it's cold, and permafrost has effectively stopped a lot of the surface water sinking underground, and so it's going thundering down the gorge uh, and incising it. So that's a relatively simple one, and, and then you can come up with a thing like this. You can work out where was the paleo water table in the past, 110, 235, and so on and so forth. And it gets a bit kind of shaky at the top because most of the stale dating can't really get back that far, and it goes back about half a million years. Um, 
okay, but as I said, styles don't always work. Um, unless you go to uranium-lead dating, you can't really get much back further than about half a million years. This is a cave in uh, California, a crystal cave. It's going from Yucca Creek here, and it's going kind of down to a, another creek at the lower level, and you've got it's a, the modern kind of river going down there, and you've got a whole series of passages. So you've got a relative chronology here. These are the oldest relic passages, like this is part of the show cave, and this is the current uh, modern one. And there's lots and lots of styles, of course, you know, you're going you're to date those and, and we'll be able to work out that, you know, those are going to come out with really old dates and these are going to come back with younger dates and no, no, they don't. Um, this is one of the problems is that quite often you go and you collect all these styles and they all come out and they tell you that, yeah, the Holocene's warm, which is not much use. Um, so not terribly useful. So we need to use other techniques. And there's another one we can use, another sort of absolute chronology, as it were, where we look at paleomagnetic dating because the... The magnetic, Earth's magnetic field has flipped from normal to reversed over various periods in, in the past, and we can detect in very, very fine-grained sediments like this sort of stuff, mud and silt, and you've got it preserved on some of the ledges there. Um, and so we can actually look at when it was either uh, normal or reversed, but that's not very, very precise because it's only telling you, well, it's normal or it's reversed, and it doesn't work be, you know, further back in time. You can't be certain, well, which reverse phase is that? So it's useful, it's telling us that some of these passages you know, are quite old. And then there's, uh, Gina, Gina mentioned uh, cosmogenic dating, and so this has been done in Crystal Cave as well, and so you've got dates up here, and that can go back quite a long way, measuring these uh, radi uh, ice, radioactive isotopes, but it's not very precise, you know, you're talking about kind of error bars of 200,000 years, but it's giving you this overall picture of uh, what's going on in terms of the, the development of that particular relatively simple cave. Um, okay, going back really, really an awfully long time. This is a cave that's uh, not worth a dig, as they say. Um, this is the Blackwater Valley in the south of Ireland, and this is a, a little quarry here with a kind of strange red mud in it, which is quite unlike anything else you see in any of the fissures in the, in the quarries there. This is what the present landscape looks like. You've got a bit of limestone here, and you've got going down to the River Blackwater, which is the main river that kind of flows along this valley for tens of kilometers. And anyway, it turns out, looking at that rather crappy fissure full of mud, it turns out that it's part of a phreatic loop. It's quite clearly a cave passage that's been filled with mud, more or less contemporaneously with its formation. It's uh, one of these parogenetic passages. Um, and, and so it's somewhere below the water table. And then uh, I managed to get some pollen, not me, somebody else got some pollen grains out, and that dates it. That tells you that these pollen grains are very old. These are 30 million years old. And so that means that... Uh, we can start to reconstruct the, the landscape because this was a phreatic loop, and there's another cave that also gives a bit more information, slightly shallow one. And so that tells us that um, the landscape essentially has not changed in 30... Well, it has a bit. You know, there were no houses back in the Oligocene or anything like that. But the overall landscape of, of the hills and the valleys, the river was doing what it is now 30 million years ago. It was following exactly the same course... Uh, from west to east. So that's uh, a, a very, very old cave that's quite useful. Anyway, now on to what I call my beloved Ogof Drynan. Marvellous cave. Anyway, um, Ogof Drynan is hideously complex, and Andy Farrant and I got involved in it it's sort of quite early on, trying to figure out, well, let's see you know, what, what's going on. How do you unravel a cave like this? Because there is so much going on in there. Um, it does recall, involve an awful lot of fieldwork. There's one trip where it was my 30th trip, it was John Stevens' 50th trip, it was Arthur Millett's 70th trip. A lot of caving trips. So the things you need to do, key observations. Andy made the point, just use your eyes, look at stuff. And one of them is the uh, working out water table altitude. You know, the phreatic, is it phreatic passage, radius passage, or a bit of, bit of both, which you've got here. Um, Flow directions, scallops. Scallops are wonderful things because they're telling you where the flow was going and they give you some really quite unexpected uh, information about diversions and detours. And also sediments. You've got some these, these wonderful sort of sediments in Gilwan Passage that, that was a seminal moment when we actually discovered those. And also look at cross-cutting relationships. Big passages cutting across little passages, little passages cutting across big passages. They're telling you something about what's going on. And this is uh, oh, the high-quality survey there is nothing to replace a high-quality survey that is accessible. And, and the, the Dryden one was absolutely vital uh, to what we did because there was so much uh, detail in it. It, it. With just a line survey, it, it really doesn't do the system justice. You can't work out all that much that's, that's going on. Um, 
And this is a little place that uh, Andy and I went digging. We spent six hours digging into this, and I finally got through, but Andy was too big. He never saw this bit. Anyway, so, sorry, Andy. Um, okay, now this is, uh, this is the main streamway in Ongoff Drive, which just goes on and on and on and on and, anyway. And, and this is where the sort of water comes. And as Andy said, we, this big passage coming in from the north, Gilwin Passage, we just assumed, just looking at the survey, you think, well, this quite clearly is an inlet, a sort of now largely abandoned inlet to the main streamway. And it's these little observations. It's this one particular trip. We just went there, and we just came across these ripples, and they were all pointing northwards. And then we looked at the scallops, and we thought, oh, my goodness. This completely changes the whole... Yeah, interpretation of what's going on. So this is the passage before this passage was here. That's more recent than this. It was all going that way. And so suddenly you've got a system that now is going south, but at some time in the past was going north. So how do you sort of work out, you know, what's going on? Well, really, Ogoff Drain, it's a compilation of multiple kind of uh, drainage routes that have actually migrated down dip sort of roughly westwards over time. And we're trying to pick out those individual sort of cave systems to figure out, you know, how it has evolved and how that has actually influenced the landscape. So if we kind of wind back almost right to the very beginning, the, the nature of the geology is such that if you went back two, three, four million years or so, there would be no limestone exposed here because it gets cut out. And so you get the carboniferous sandstone sitting directly on, on old red sandstone. So the very earliest stage, you've got a little bit of limestone sort of exposed up here, near where the sort of Clinic River Clinic Valley is now, and that would have drained into a sort of old passage here. You see, we've got this coming along here. That's the oldest part of the system, the furthest up deep, coming out of a, a big sort of rising here. And one of the classic things was, how old are the hills? You know, this had been found quite early on. This is called Mega Drive. And there's a big kind of uh, embayment there called Cumlan Thlanrenath. And Andy, one day, he was sitting in the hut, and he said, if, if Kumthlanrenath is younger than Megadrive, then there should be a big passage under Gilwyn Hill. And six weeks later, that was found. And we thought, sod it. We should have gotten another look. Anyway, but one of the things, so that's taken us right back to the very earliest stage of the landscape. And this is a place I've stood at uh, a few times and just stood in awe at what you actually see here, a sort of a relic of a much, much earlier landscape. I'm up here at about... 400 meters. The floor of the Clinic Valley is down at about 100, 110 meters, something like that. That sink for the earliest phase of Ogoff Drynan was way up here, up in the sky. It was 300 meters higher than the floor of the valley now. And that really, you know, that's when we start to think Ogoff Drynan is very, very old. You know, it's not just some uh, Johnny Come Lately cave system. So then, as we work our way through the system, we find that here's the old system here, and it gets progressively captured southwards. Rather than going kind of southeast, it's captured due south, and that tells us that what must have happened is you've got the, uh, a bit more limestone exposed here, and then you've got a bit of limestone exposed down here in the fluid, val in the fluid valley, you see. Uh, and so the, limestone, the water is now leaking out of another hole in the bucket, and it's going due south towards that valley. Then we get this big reversal. That's the one that we see sort of in Gilwin Passage. So you've got a whole series of passages, and they're all heading off towards that direction. And that's because the Clinic Valley has now actually been cut down deeper than the Lewid, Fluid Valley, and so the water is now actually going to drain sort of northwards because that's, the, that's effectively the most uh, economical route because the gradients are ridiculously low in Olgoff Drain, and you're talking about a few metres per kilometre. Very, very low drainage, so if you just dig the valley a little bit deeper at one end, it all just flows the other way. It's like a hydrological uh, seesaw. Anyway, so the thing is that, uh, so you've got a whole series of sinks have actually developed along this margin where the limestone has been exposed, all these sort of sinks coming in, merging, and then heading north towards that valley. And, a th and also, it's clear that water was draining from here. So the limestone must have been exposed at a lower point here than it was here. And that was something that we really didn't expect. That came out of our analysis. When we had to write this up, there was going to be a special issue of, of cave and car science and Ogoff Drain, and I thought, oh my God, I've got to write it up. And that really focuses the mind. And so when you're putting it all together uh, and, and putting, working about kind of the altitudes and where things were, and then suddenly I sort of realized, oh my goodness, 
this has been coming from here. And that explains a sort of rather odd part of the system. This is called uh, Pontypool or Bust, or the swims, and there's an awful lot of sand in there. And this sand is, is, a, is a long way from any of these sinks up here. And you just think, oh, yeah, this is coming because it's coming straight in from the fluid valley. It's kind of dropping down quite steeply. So dig here. Or, or don't, if you've read the latest Descent and all the controversy about entrance to Dragoff Dryland, but it's quite a long way from the other ones. So I'd be interested to see what's there. Anyway, so. So then finally, you get this uh, flow reversal southwards again, because what has happened is that Gilwin, uh, the drainage towards, along Gilwin Passage to towards the, the Clidic Gorge, uh, you get the limestone, the valley, this valley is being lowered still further, so the drainage gets um, captured down that way. And you think, but oh, but then perhaps Clinic Valley will kind of cut down a bit more and it'll be captured another way, but there's actually a fault that actually stops that happening. So the Clinic Valley basically was out of the race by then. And so ever since then, it's been going down that way, right the way down to there. And uh, an awful lot of the actual time involved in the evolution of the cave has been involved in this route here, probably about 60% of... Uh, of that. Um, and, and of course, it, it, as I can say, worth a dig down here. Look, this is right from this chamber. This is a current sort of end of the, the present streamway. And that's a lot of cave still to be found. And there are various points where this, the river's been known to sink up here and, and down here, where we know that quite clearly there is uh, the main passage is somewhere on this, on this route. So there's still a lot to. I said by the year 2000 it would be 100 kilometers, but the impetus seems to have gone. Um, it's a long way to the end. Okay, so how old are the landscapes? From what Andy and I did, looking at all these sort of different passages and such like, we were able to work out how much the landscape has changed between sort of various, the, the earliest phases of the development of Argoff Drynan and the, the present day. And so... This is, this is Slangatic Mountain in the distance. Clinic, Clinic Valley, more than 300 meters of downcutting since uh, the first phases were formed. Yeah, that's a huge amount. It's 1,000 feet. That's a lot. You know, so that really makes you think this is a very old system. Uh, the Usk Valley quite clearly has been there a long, long time. The Usk Valley is millions of years old, so it's not a kind of recent uh, thing. Cumthlan Renath, which is this big embayment here, more than 600 meters. That scarp back here has gone back more than 650 meters since the earliest stages, which is why you've got a, a big section of passage under this hill, which actually relates to a big section of passage under here, under the Blowing, where there's been much less um, landscape retreat. It's only perhaps a bit more than 100 meters of, of scar retreat. So it's not a consistent retreat. It's quite sort of patchy. And that ties in with glaciation, and you've got... Um, uh, glacial cirques, you've got ice accumulation and such like. So it's a complicated business. And then you've got the Lewin Valley, um, which is a few kilometers off to the, to, to the other side. And you've had perhaps 80 meters of down cutting since the limestone was first unroofed in that particular bit of the passage, or in that particular bit of the, the landscape. And as I said, Andy, we, we figured, we thought, yeah, this is old. This is, we kind of, before we had any dates at all, we thought, million and a half, something like that, just to kind of fit in all that cave development and landscape development is a lot of time. Uh, and they, these are some dates. Um, where do these come from, Andy? Um, Andy just sent them to me. Anyway, um, I was there in that paper we did. Yes, that was it. Yes, anyway. <laughs> so anyway, these are uranium series dates, and so they're mostly uranium thorium, which gets really quite flaky beyond uh, half a million. But they're all telling you that You've got very big old passages up dip, which are very old, which is nice. And then you've got stuff which is down dip, the present sort of streamway. And, well, the clock of doom ticks on. Um, and Andy was just telling me that, in fact, you've, uh, there, are, there are uranium lead dates, which potentially could take us back much, much further, which take back some of the older passages in Ongolf Dryner to kind of 1.4 million, something like that. So it tells us that Ongolf Dryner is a very, very old system. And by, um, finish with the final slide. So, by kind of just simple observations, you don't need the fancy stuff to do the, to actually give you the numbers, but we've got um, simple observations. Is it phreatic or vados? Where are the transitions? Whereabouts in the passages are they? Um, scallops. Scallops are just amazingly useful for telling you where the passage is going. Um, 
as an aside, the entrance, the first few hundred meters of the entrance series in Aggie, everybody always thought, oh, it flows inwards. It didn't, it originally flowed outwards, and that was just one of these observations. Oh my goodness, they're going the wrong way. So little observations like that can actually throw a whole new light on where to dig and how the cave has developed. Um, sediments and things, cross-cutting relationships, and also a good survey. Good surveys are just so amazingly useful, uh, both to cave scientists and also to uh, cave diggers. Right, I'll finish there. Thank you very much.